Hey, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, May 1st, and this is the weekly market update. Anything that you see or hear on this video or podcast is not to be construed as investment advice. I'm not a financial advisor. I don't know your individual circumstances, your risk tolerance. It's for informational purposes only. Do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, let's get into the reality check. So, you know, I've been talking for a while about the fact that I believe we're in the, one of the biggest bubbles in the history of the world. I don't think that that's hyperbole. And another thing is that sometimes I get accused of cherry picking data or charts, but, you know, I just report the news, weekly news. I collect and aggregate news items, things that I see on Twitter that I find interesting. Uh, there's a danger when I do that, that I'm getting stuck in some confirmation bias, but that's, you know, this is what I report. This is reporting. I'm conscious of those things. And I try to not get sucked into that. Nevertheless, let's take a look at this chart because I think it's instructive of where we're at and, and what I think the danger is here for a lot of people. So this is the S and P 500 index versus margin debt year over year change percent change and what you see on the bottom is the margin debt uh percent change year over year the chart you see is the s p 500 index and you see these previous tops right let's go back to 2008 approximately you had margin debt over 50 percent let's go back to the previous bubble the tech bubble around the turn of the century 1999, 2000, margin debt over 50%. Look at the declines you had subsequent to that as the liquidations took place, as liquidity dried up. You know, Stan Druckenmiller says that liquidity is the primary driver of equity markets. I believe that, I agree with that. Um, Marty Zweig, another guy that I follow, used to say, you know, when the Fed, three steps in a stumble, he, you know, that was a liquidity type, uh, view that you, you know, three cuts and the market would take off in the Fed funds rate. Then if the Fed's Fed, if the Federal Reserve raised rates three times, you were going to have a market stumble because liquidity would get strangled. But look where we're at over here currently. We're at record highs in the S&P, right? Um, everybody's making a ton of money. Robin Hood, you know, all the stories, GameStop, all the bubblicious conditions we're seeing. And can things get any better? Our earnings are taking off. Um, we have housing prices up 17% year over year. We have used car prices up 50% because of the um, shortage of automo new automobiles because of chip shortages. We have agricultural commodities taken off. We have copper at new highs. We have oil breaking out. Uh, we have lumber up 200, two, over two, 300%, something like that. Just across the board, I can go on, I can go on a list and just tell you. What I can tell you is this, this is, this is bubblicious. This is, this is going to end in tears. This is going to be a trail of tears. This is going to be an apocalypse for many people. I don't know what's going to pop the bubble. I don't know if the bubble is going to double from here. It could. I mean, Japan went to 100 times earnings, and then the bubble popped. Eventually, the bubble will pop. All bubbles pop. We're in the biggest bubble of all time. I don't know if it's going to be the tax increases or the policies that the Biden administration's pushing forward. I don't know if it's going to be, you know, oil going over hundred dollars a barrel and gasoline going to four and a half or five dollars a gallon. I don't know if we're going to have a sudden breakout in inflation that surprises the Fed and makes them reverse course and pull start pulling liquidity. I don't know what it's going to be. It, it's going to happen. We're going to know what the what the pr what the pricking of the bubble, the catalyst was in hindsight. I can tell you right now, though, that this is very dangerous. Now, people, I'm not a perma bear or a perma bull. I try to take positions that I think are undervalued, and I try to ride them. Right now, the commodity resource reflation, if you will, um, is the game that we're in. Uh, it's working out fairly well for us. I mean, just about everything's hitting on 16 cylinders. That won't continue forever. That's liquidity-driven. It's inflation, it's reflationary, inflationary. You know, we have a short-term view that all this 
sugar high money pump, physical pump is driving a lot of this. Will it be able to catch fire and just be self-sustaining uh, inflationary wise? I don't know that we're going to have a you know 10 year super cycle. I don't know what we're gonna, what's going to happen. I will tell you that more and more economies are opening up. You know, I track on, we can go to Worldometer and track the pandemic. Um, you know, Brazil's already rolled over. Cases are declining. India hasn't peaked yet, but it will. You're, a lot of European countries have peaked. And more and more countries are going to open up as they see more and more examples of states like Florida, Texas, Tennessee, all these other states in the U.S. that are opening up. The pressure is building for other people to open up. You had big marches in Europe over the last couple of weeks. So that's going to put additional pressure, right? And everybody's printing money. Everybody is throwing money at this problem. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing this huge reflationary sh money pump sugar high. Whether it's sustainable, I don't know. Right now, that's the game. That's, that's the tune that's being, that's being played. That's what we're dancing to. But this is, this is just another indicator of how dangerous things are out there. This is not going to continue. This is being driven by a lot of newbies tourists, people sitting at home, trading on Robin Hood, and just even professionals. I mean, there's so much liquidity out there. It's going into these markets. And it's self-reinforcing until it's not. Something will come along and prick this bubble. I just thought this is just amazing to me. So that's the reality check. Um, we'll get into, see, we got a lot of news this week. So let's get into it because a lot of it's pretty fascinating and pretty uh, awesome. I thought this is a potential game changer for the uranium market. In case you weren't paying attention, I know many of you are, you're pretty switched on. Uh, Sprott Asset Management, one of the biggest you know, resource asset management uh, companies based in Canada. They announced uh, last week that Sprott Asset Management uh, has entered into a definitive agreement with UPC, Uranium Participation Corporation, pursuant to which UPC shareholders will become unit holders of the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, a newly formed entity managed by Sprott Asset Management. Each UPC common share will be exchanged for one unit of the newly formed trust at the election of UPC shareholders that are Canadian. It uh, goes through all this. Basically, they're converting UPC, which you know was holding uranium in UF6, which is based in Canada, which mostly trades in Canada. It does have an over-the-counter listing here, but it's not very liquid. Sprott's going to take it over and turn it into a trust, like with a, um, like their silver and gold trusts. Why is this important? Well, it's going to be a situation, once it lists in Canada and the U.S., where if you go and buy shares of the trust, the people that are managing the trust are forced to go out and buy the actual commodity. You know, we were, everybody's been waiting for UPC because of the premium to net asset value for them to come to the market, issue shares and buy more uranium. You know, we've seen the, all the other buying by a lot of the junior miners have been buying a little bit here and there, probably about three and a half million pounds in total, 4 million pounds. I don't know off the top of my head, something like that. This is a situation where you have Sprott Asset Management getting involved, creating a trust, and it's going to add a lot of liquidity, and it's going to list in the U.S. It's going to make it easier for institutions, retail investors to buy into physical uranium, just like you can buy a gold ETF or silver ETF or palladium, platinum ETF, whatever the case may be. And so when more money comes into the managers of the trust, i.e. Sprott Asset Management, they are forced to go out and buy more uranium. Our view is, is that there's not that much uranium out there, physical uranium. Is this going to be the catalyst for the Sprott price to go up, go crazy? Is this going to be the game changer? Very possibly. No one can know the future, but there's been a lot of discussion in the uranium Twitterverse. Uh, a lot of smart people think this is the game changer. Uh, this transaction, just so you know, is going to close in the late second quarter or early third quarter of this year. So we're already in the second quarter. So um, April, May, June, sometime in late June or you know July, something like that, August. So this is something to look forward to. And um, the, the, why is this important? Well, you know, 
Trader Ferg gave us a tweet this week, I thought was uh, pretty good of why this is a big deal. Uh, a couple of bullet points here. U.S. is where the real liquidity is. That's right. I mean, you know, there's not a lot, you know, a lot of people don't trade Canadian stocks. They don't know how to do it. They don't want to do it. Institutions don't want to do it. Uh, it's, nobody's going to be like, there's no liquidity in the over-the-counter uh, UPC shares here in the U.S. So our capital markets are bigger. We have this huge liquidity pump going on. This is like right place, right time type situation. Um, Sprott's marketing machine should grow assets under management. That goes without saying. I mean, they know how to sell. I mean, their gold, go look at the size of their gold and silver trust. They're huge. Um, increased assets under management equals more pounds uh, bought. That's what's going to happen. I mean, do the pounds exist? This is going to be a real price discovery to see how much liquidity, how much available material is actually in the spot market. Uh, this is a clean way for institutions to play the theme. There's no mining risk. They can just buy the trust. Um, you know, you could just buy the shares and if they double over the next five or six years, you have a decent return, right? You're going to beat probably the market averages. Um, watch ESG funds performance chase as tech and renewables get killed. So we're seeing more and more discussion of nuclear power being considered green, being considered renewable, being considered to be ESG compliant. I mean, that really have no choice. If you want to lower carbon emissions, you have to be uh, an advocate for nuclear power. You're just not a serious person or you haven't thought out your position correctly. So this is a big deal in my view. Um, the amount of money that could come pouring into this. And then think about once this thing gets going, you're going to see the re reflexivity hit, right? Because if this starts moving and the liquidity comes in, um, and institutions are able to just buy this thing. I mean, are they going to be able to even find, I mean, you could, I don't know what's going to happen. The market is very thin is what we've been told. I mean, you could see a big move in uranium this year going into the end of the year, this could be the catalyst. And then the utilities are going to get caught flat footed right at the inter at the, at the inflection point of when they need to start buying material anyways. They've been sitting on their laurels. I don't know. I, I would like to, I would like to be a fly on the wall in the fuel buyers offices if they're even acknowledging this or think about it or discussing it, because this is what happened. We didn't have a vehicle like this during the last uranium bull market. Okay. Um, and now we have this with the internet, with Reddit, discord, all these uh, retail guys, all the pumping and if we have this really, really illiquid small market, I mean, if real money comes into this thing, we could have an explosive rally. So this is very exciting in my book. This is like the biggest news in the week. Okay, let's talk about tankers. We haven't talked about tankers. You know, it's like the only thing that isn't going up, right? Um, if you look at the rest of shipping, we talked about this briefly in some previous weeks. Shipping's going nuts. I'll talk about it uh, some more in another slide. But this is an interesting slide. I will put a link. Uh, links to all of these articles uh, will be in the show notes, as you guys know, so you can peruse these articles at your leisure. 25% of tanker fleet will be 20 years old or more by 2023. From the article, more than 25% of the active tanker fleet, i.e. one quarter, is set to reach 20 years of age by 2023, creating quite a scrapping candidate list going forward. I'd say, you know, we've talked about this before. This is another thing that's setting us, itself up for a big rally. Uh, we've been long suffering tanker bulls, but I think that we've seen what can already happen in shipping with container shipping and now bulk carrier shipping with not enough supply. And I'll talk about like that in another slide. Those shares are going nuts. And I think it's just a matter of time as these economies open up, oil demand continues to increase. Uh, inventories continue to decrease. And at some point they're going to intersect. The price is going to go up uh, and more oil is going to have to be shipped. There's going to be more oil demand. So you're running into a situation where these tankers are getting to the end of their life. You know, once a tanker gets in that 15 to 20 year time frame of its age, it starts running into those higher um, survey costs. It's, you know, is it worth it to, 
to spend the money and do what you need to do to it to keep it running? Um, or, you know, do you look at scrapping it? And the other thing is, is that scrapping prices right now, because steel prices are so freaking high that the scrapping prices are so high right now. You know, part of the problem has been is that the shipbreaking yards in India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan have been closed down or shall we say um, the volumes they've been able to accept have been down because of the COVID crisis. That's going to change. So we should see more scrapping. Uh, maybe we won't, I, you know, but that's kind of the catalyst. The, the, the age of the fleet is, is getting older and older every day that goes by. The ability of ship owners to keep these things going, you know, and major shippers of oil, like big oil companies, they don't want to put their cargoes on a ship that may be the next Exxon Valdez. They don't want the thing. They don't want the publicity. So that's going to encourage. Now, there are people that will. They don't care. There's oil trade. I mean, there's all kinds of people, right, in business. But if you're a big, large oil company that has this you know, Royal Dutch Shell, BP, whatever, with this ESG thing, the last thing you want to do is be hiring on 20-year-old tankers and hoping that they don't have an accident. So data from Vessels Value shows that of the 13,211 tankers in its database, including small tankers, over 3,000 are 20 years old and older. There seems to be some positive developments as old vessel supply has begun to respond to higher steel prices and scheduled environmental regulations prompting an increase in vessel recycling, albeit from very low levels, according to Euronav. So take a look at this article. I think our time is coming in tankers. Be patient. It's probably a story for later this year, or early 2022, but I think this is going to happen. And based on what we've seen in a lot of the other shipping sectors, we're going to get a decent move when this thing does turn. I mean, here's an article that kind of backs up what I'm saying. Container shipping, I, you know, is off the hook. You know, the number of container ships stuck at anchor off Los Angeles and Long Beach is down to around 20 per day from 30 a few months ago. Does this mean the capacity crunch in the trans-Pacific market is finally easing? Absolutely not. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. What I'm seeing is unprecedented. We are seeing a tsunami of freight. This is an analyst uh, from Freight Forward or Flexport. So they kind of know what they're talking about because they are the ones trying to charter these ships and containers. What is it again that this person said? What I'm seeing is unprecedented. We are seeing a tsunami of freight. Quote, for the month of May, everything on the Trans-Pacific is basically sold out. We had one client who needed something loaded in May that was extremely urgent and who was ready to pay $15,000 per container. I couldn't get it loaded. So we're seeing the reports start to come in for a lot of the uh, container shipping stocks. They're going nuts. Um, I have some small positions like in Zim. Uh, I don't have it in the portfolio. I mean, you can't kiss all the girls. I can't have a hundred stocks in the portfolio, but I talk about these things and you can go off on your own. I, you know, I get emails even from clients or subscribers. Well, I'm going to get into this. or we're going to get into that. Look, I'm not a guru. All I'm doing is putting out some research on some things that I uh, think are are doing well. I mean, we have this huge inflationary or reflationary impulse. It's affecting everything. We can't, you know, can't kiss all the girls. But this is uh, this is amazing what's happening. It's starting to spill. Out. It's, it has already spilled over into bulk uh, carriers that carry, you know, iron ore, coal, grains. I mean, that's going nuts now too. So I think the Baltic Dry Index made an all time high this week. So, or a recent uh, near-term high. So uh, that's, that's tremendous also. Okay, more indications of issues in commodities. Uh, farmers shift to feeding animals wheat due to high corn prices. You know, corn, pri corn is the primary feed for finishing animals, right? Whether it's uh, beef, pork, or chicken. And the, the corn price is going nuts because of the disaster that happened in China last year with the flooding. And the fact that China, China had the, their hog uh, population um, decimated by a hog swine flu. They had to destroy basically their entire hog population. They're trying to rebuild it now. Pork, as you know, is a very, very um, big protein source for China in particular. So you're getting this huge amount of, I, I showed a chart last week. I mean, it showed typical grain imports, corn imports into China. I mean, it's off, it's like five times what it normally is. 
And so what's happening is, is that you've seen substitution, right, with wheat. Now, wheat is primarily not used as an animal feed. It's used to make bread and, and, and things like that for human consumption. So you're getting these pressures, pressures all along the supply chain. You know, I've talked about this before, that agriculture is going to sneak up and bite people. Food prices are going to go crazy. We better keep having exceptional growing seasons with no problems, but we're not going to see that in my view. And our grain carryovers are going to get precarious and prices are going to respond. It's a tremendous opportunity and it's going to lead to political, potentially political, economically, and so, social unrest around the world. This is what you know precipitated the Arab Spring. So what's it saying here in this article? China's expanding hog herd is vacuuming up the world's feed grains and forcing traders to dip into wheat reserves, a crop that's normally saved for humans to eat. Quote, China continues to be buying everything they can. ADM, that's Archer Daniels Midland, they're a big grain trader. Storage, uh, they do all the grain movements, trading. ADM chief executive Juan Lucinio said Tuesday on a call with investors, they're buying corn, but they're buying wheat as well. Quote, we are running out of corn in the country and wheat got really cheap, said Joe Neusmeyer, a broker at Frontier Futures in Minneapolis. By mid-June, quote, the only thing to feed critters at that time will be wheat, unquote. But you can't just feed unlimited wheat to cattle and hogs. Okay, it causes problems in their digestive tract. So what's that going to lead to? You've already got, I mean, I'm fortunate. I mean, food costs are, I, I notice how high they are for meat prices. And it doesn't really affect me um, too much. I'm, I, I'm, I have the ability to pay. Uh, I haven't really changed uh, anything in my diet, but I noticed the prices. I don't know how other people are surviving. How, how are people that are struggling uh, affording to eat? I don't know. So this is going to lead to a problem if this doesn't get rectified. However, it's an opportunity for us, right? I mean, I'm, I, I keep telling you that one man's uh, problems is another man's opportunity. So where's the opportunity? Fertilizer industry emerging from bear market. Talked about it before. Again, I mean, I'm only a one-man operation. I haven't added any fertilizer stocks to the portfolio. I intend on doing that. Uh, we'll be adding a coal stock this month in the May issue. Uh, we already have uh, a Met Coal producer and a royalty company that has Met Coal. Uh, uh, so we'll be adding a uh, large coal producer. So we're kind of really seeing a lot of um, opportunity there. But fertilizer is another place we're seeing opportunity. What happens, you know, farmers really do struggle sometimes. So when they get cash flush, they like to buy more equipment. They like to increase the amount of inputs they put into their soil to get more production. Um, this is especially true in overseas emerging markets like India and those places. You know, they'll skimp on fertilizers if they don't have the money. But when people get cash flush, they want to get more, they want to maximize their production and take advantage of the, of the flush times. So from the article, the fertilizer industry has seen an astonishing turnaround in its fortunes over the past year. The beginning of the COVID-19 crisis last year marked the bottom of what had been a nine-year funk in prices and profits. But then something happened, or rather a combination of fa favorable event trends. Perpetually credit-hungry farmers got expansive monetary policy, Governments hastened to ensure food supplies would be secured and consumers jammed their home shelves. With farmers' incomes rising in most of the world, they had the cash to spend on more fertilizer applications, sometimes on more marginal land. Yeah, that's what happens, right? I mean, something that's not productive at, you know, 350 corn is all of a sudden productive at $6 corn. So I think we're going to have, we're going to, before this cycle is over, we'll have record food prices. We're going to have issues. I really hope we don't. Um, have some of the weather issues that I think we're going to have over the next decade. I suggest that uh, I'm not going to get into it in this call, uh, but you know my you know my thoughts on this. We've had excellent growing conditions for around a decade or more. I suspect that's going to change going forward. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be worldwide, but it will be regional. But things are so precarious that if you have, for example, what happened in China, which really wasn't reported here in the West too much. I mean, they were talking. I remember when they were talking about the Three Gorges Dam could collapse. I mean, that would have wiped out central China. But even though it didn't, 
they still had record flooding in a lot of their agricultural areas and it wiped out a lot of their grain crop. That's why you're seeing the frenzy you're seeing now. Financial Times says liquidity driven oil stock rally will not last. Here's, you know, this is the gas lighting I love. I wanted to put this on here. You can read the entire article. I'll put a link to it. Um, let me read some of the quotes and I'll comment. Uh, I cherry pick some quotes from the article. Quote, with the liquidity punch bowl overflowing, at least they're admitting it, I'll say. That's, that's good. Even the wallflowers at the party can get a dance. Oil stocks have all rallied sharply in price this year, leaving the broader market behind. Yeah, we're enjoying that. A bright price surge has helped. But truthfully, business as usual is not a realistic scenario for the energy sector. Quote, in the largest markets, U.S. and China, petrol demand has not exactly surged ahead. This is where the gas lighting starts. Hasn't surged ahead? What, relative to what time frame, FT? We're coming out of a pandemic. Petrol demand in China is actually back to almost normal uh, demand. Demand's climbing all over the world. Inventories are going down. What is the FT talking about? See, they have an agenda. They have a view that oil's going away. Who doesn't understand that the renewable transition to electrification is going to be completely enabled by fossil fuels? I've explained this before. So I'm not going to go on a rant. Back to the article. True, China reports more traffic congestion, but that is at odds with Beijing's touting of climate change credentials. If you subscribe to this periodical, if you are paying money for this type of analysis, you're getting ripped off. Let's read that again. True, China reports more traffic congestion. Well, I'm glad that the FT author of this article acknowledged reality. But that is at odds with Beijing's touting of climate change credentials. What are these people talking about? China doesn't give a rat's behind about climate change. They're building 10,000, 30,000 megawatts of new coal generation. Go to ncoal.org. You can track it in real time. What, is this, what are these people talking about? This is gaslighting all the way. I'm taking the other side of this big. We're in it to win it. to the article. Most portfolio managers today cannot easily square holding lots of oil stocks with the demands of clients keen to address climate change. This year, the EU sustainable finance disclosure regulation will put pressure on European fund managers to back up their promises on responsible investing. Okay, we'll see what happens. Um, oil stocks are some of the best performing stocks this year. The oil price really hasn't fully rallied to where I think it's going. Everything's happening like we thought. Uh, it's funny, two of the biggest oil companies that are transitioning away from oil just reported record, you know, not record, but um, very, very decent, lovely cash flow and earnings, BP and, and Royal Dutch. And one of them just raised their dividend like 20%. I think it was Royal Dutch. So, you know, this is all fun and games and everybody's ESG until it, you know, starts affecting portfolio performance. You know, we'll see what hap what everybody's view is when gasoline's $5 a gallon and oil's over $100 a barrel. We are going to have an energy crisis in the next couple of years in the world. It's just, it, we're set up for it because we just do not, you're not going to transition in a year or two to electrified economy. It's not going to happen. You know, I read an article this week. Uh, it was on uh, Business Insider. I'll try to find it and put it in the links. I didn't make a, 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 a graph. A, slide this week about it. I thought it was amazing. So they did a study and poll in California, 20% of the people that bought an electric vehicle got rid of it after they had it for a while. Why? Unable to charge it. Didn't realize how long it took to charge it. Not sufficient charging. You know, you plug the thing in at your house, what they call level one charging. And an hour later, you can go three miles. Now you can boost that up by, you know, raising it to 240 the voltage or 480 you can put a more robust charging station but there's not enough charging so people are like this is like doesn't meet my needs that's in california so of course you know the biden administration and everybody's talking well that's just a temporary problem john will get solved but will it we'll see this is total gaslighting this is you put this on your list the ft as a reverse barometer when oil's a hundred dollars a barrel there'll be 
an article. I'm going to keep this. I'm keeping this in the gaslighting propaganda file so that when they come out, you know, later this summer, early fall, when, when oil prices are in, you know, $75, $80 a barrel or next year when they're over $100 a barrel, uh, and they're talking about oil stocks, you know, are up hundreds of percent. They'll be talking about why you should have bought oil stocks. I'm going to catch them. Okay. And that'll be the time to sell. Okay. Copper made new highs this week. I mean, this is like off the hook. I think copper, I saw it as high as 457, 454 a pound. I mean, this is just nuts what's going on in the copper market. You know, we have a copper producer in the portfolio in the actionable intelligence alert newsletter. And that thing is just making all, it's making new highs. Um, this is just amazing what's happening. I mean, if you look at the gearing that this particular company I have has to, I mean, when I'm talking about gearing, I'm talking about its leverage to the copper price, right? It gets to a certain point where you are above the production cost and everything just starts dropping to the bottom line. I mean, this particular stock, I mean, I think at copper at 350 and the difference between 350 and 450 copper, which would be, you know, about a third move higher, 30, a little bit higher than 33% higher, led to like over 100, 100% um, leverage to the cash flow to the company. So um, yeah, that's what we're going to see, right? I mean, you look at comp big companies like tech, they reported earnings, um, their copper component was going nuts. They're doing a big copper expansion. If you look at some of the countries out there, I mean, I'm taking another look at Mongolia, right? The whole country is based on copper mining and thermal coal mining. Um, that might be another potential. I have a, a, a view on that. I'm not going to get into it in this uh, uh, discussion this week because we're running out of time. But I mean, let's let's take a look at this, right? This is just uh, from Bloomberg on last Monday. Iron ore futures and Chinese steel prices climbed to fresh highs. This is the headline. Economic growth, green energy plans, bolster outlook for metals. Copper climbed to the highest in almost a decade as the global recovery from the pandemic extended a rally in metal mar metals markets. Aluminum is surging and iron ore jumped to a fresh high as commodities advanced towards the highs of the last super cycle. Met metals are benefiting as the large, world's largest economies announced programs to build back greener from the coronavirus shock. The U.S. recovery is accelerating and Joe Biden's $2.25 trillion infrastructure plan will highlight sectors like electric cars, driving further gains in commodities critical to the green energy transition. That's coming alongside a continued economic boom in China, where a push to reduce emissions is filtering through to supply cuts for some metals just as demand is picking up. So as I said earlier, I track world meter. I'm watching the coronavirus decline in a lot of countries. India is still increasing. But a lot of places are going to start opening up as the months go along. I mean, it's just going to happen. And we're already at record highs in commodities. What's going to happen is more economies open up and more recovery happens. I mean, how high? Robert Friedland said that uh, the big mining magnet, that's a big copper uh, advocate or bull, when asked, where does he think copper is going? He, how high does he think the price will go? He said, uh, you're going to need a telescope to see the price. Can it go to five, six, eight dollars a pound at some point during this uh, cycle? I don't know. You know, when you have these cycles, these up cycles, they usually extend past the previous cycle. So we're already above. We've just eclipsed the, the previous high. But on an inflation based uh, metric, we're still below the previous high. So I don't know how, how we're going, but um, this is... Uh, if you're in copper miners right now, you're doing very well. I mean, I bought a small position in tech back during the spring of this year. Or maybe it was last year. I can't even remember. During the depths of the coronavirus, I mean, tech was selling for like giveaway prices and it's up like over 100%. And that's like a major mining company. So those opportunities, uh, the easy money has been made on those. But uh, as long as these prices keep moving higher, you know, we're going to see now what's going to end up happening is uh, if you don't already have an asset producing, here's what starts to happen, right? This happens in every cycle. The shortages hit, like if you're trying to bring a mine on and buy things, now all these price increases are hitting you um, for steel, for your plant, for workers, for, so if you already have a producing asset, if you already have the, the, the sunk costs of a existing mine and you can just turn it back on then you have the ability to, uh, you know, have that real good torque to the price. 
And what usually happens in these mining booms is the energy costs go up and the ability to get all the materials you need to build the mine and get it going, you know, that starts eating into your margins. So we'll see that at some point. But uh, right now, hey, man, it's glory days for, for everything that we're in. And uh, we're starting to see earnings come through now. Uh, I expect a lot of the stocks, a lot of the oil stocks are responding. I mean, I, you know, I talk about Athabasca oil sands. It was one of the freebies I gave away. It's not in the portfolio. But Eric Nuttall was on uh, BNN this week. And, you know, he owns a big chunk that he bought from Equinor uh, off market. And he was, you know, talking about the gearing it has to the oil price. He said, you know, at $50 oil, you know, it, it doesn't really work. It's not, you know, it's not that it's not viable, but, you know, at 60 and above, the thing turns into an ATM. And that's where we're at. We're above 60, right? And we think oil's going higher. Now, uh, that stock has responded. I mean, that stock jumped like 15%, him just talking about it on BNN. And, you know, people start understanding, they're not fully understanding the torque that a lot of these companies have towards these commodity prices. And when these earnings start coming through, when these cash flows start coming to, through, generalist investors are going to start pouring back into these things. You're going to see that rotation happening, uh, which we saw a little bit of it like a couple months ago. You're going to see that happen again. People are going to be like, man, these things are ATMs. Let me, you know, and they're undervalued. So we're going to see more of that uh, if these prices stay up where they're at or go higher as these you know, earnings, a couple quarters of these earnings come through, these stocks are going to go nuts. You're already seeing a lot of buybacks being announced in Canada by a lot of these companies also. Okay, the cash flow is being recycled. Shale producers are being, you know, they're not going nuts with this oil price. Yes, the rig count's increasing, but they're not going nuts. They're staying to what they said they're going to do, which is pay down debt and return cash to shareholders. So everything is lining up perfectly for what's, you know, what's happening here. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. Uh, a lot of good news. A lot of good things are happening. Um, I'm really excited. Uh, I don't want to get uh, too giddy. I don't want to spike the football because, you know, I still am on that. I still haven't decided if we're in a real super cycle that's sustainable or if this is just a sugar rush. But that's the tune that's being played right now. So we're in it to win it. Um, and, uh, if you're interested in seeing how we take advantage of these types of, uh, things that we're talking about on these calls, on these videos, um, you can, you know, check out the, um, actionable intelligence alert newsletter. Uh, there's a link in the, uh, in the, in the show notes. Another thing that I encourage you to check out is I, I do a weekly email where I send out information, um, it's more of a high level general knowledge around whatever commodities are what's happening and in, in, in what we're doing, the themes that we're involved with. It's just a weekly email. I don't bombard you. And uh, that's available in the show notes. Also, I also have a offer there that uh, uh, an ebook that I put together that you can get for as a gift if you um, give up your email address. So that's something you may be interested in. A lot of people email me or DM me and say, can I get a uh, back issue? I don't do that. I don't give back issues. My work takes a lot of time. It's very lucrative. People pay for it. I don't give free samples out. If you want to see an example of the writing or what we talk about or how the newsletter works, you can get um, a, you know, go to Patreon, $5 contribution. We'll get you uh, a sample of the previous months or the most recent uh, stock pick. That's a one-time thing. You don't just get the stock pick forever. Every time we come out with one, you get one shot at it. Uh, you'll see how, what kind of stocks we get involved with and, or, and, or you can check out the email, get on the email list. Uh, like I said, we don't bombard you. We don't sell it. We don't, uh, hit you up three times a day. Like some email marketers, it's a relationship. I'm, I'm trying to develop a relationship with you and build up that trust that, okay, this is what this guy's talking about. This is what, uh, this makes sense to me and show you value. Cause I want you as a customer. Um, I want you a customer as my, of my newsletter, and I don't want to be sleazy about it. I want you to see what you're getting involved with and see if you agree with the premises and the thinking. That's, that's the whole point. So if you're interested in that, check out the show notes. Um, like I said, guys, it's really enjoyable this week. Uh, so uh, thanks for the support. Channel continues to grow. I appreciate it. Let's keep it going. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. Take it easy.